then uh, rolling, they're rolling. All right, everyone. Um, I do have a couple of questions to start off. Um, so this is Shelley Gellin, the associate producer of the film, and Shane Harvey, who composed the music. Please. And um, Shane was showing me that he has uh, the the amulet, the necklace that you see on Paulie. Believe it or not, as many times as I've seen this film, Shane, having brought this with him tonight, came me in to look at the film in a different way. I had never noticed that this is something that Graham Greene wears throughout the film, and then we see it on Palmy at the end. I hadn't clued in to that. So I'm, I'm hoping, uh, by way of starting, that we could, I think this mic will work for you, because I'm going to be going around with this one. Testing, one, two, testing. Hey. Um, so, could you tell us, uh, uh, the symbol on, it looks like a sun wheel almost, but I don't know what the symbol means. Is this an authentic item? Where is this from? Is it just a prop? What do you make of the presence of it um, through the film? Anything you want to say, please. Okay, okay, great. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming, everyone. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, we start off with the amulet or the, ne the necklace. I have to say that I, I don't really have the answers to those questions, other than the fact that they, they are props. There were two of them actually uh, made, and usually that's a common theme in filmmaking. When there's a piece like that, they'll make more than one in case one's damaged or one gets lost or whatever. So um, this was give it, gifted to me from Richard Bogaisky, actually, uh, sometime after the completion of the film. Um, which shows the beginning of our, I would call it our lifelong friendship and collaboration, which lasted a good 27 years. 32. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen this film for a long time, um, believe it or not. Um, it brings back a, <clears throat> a lot of amazing memories. Um, working with Richard was, uh, you know, one of the greatest uh, experiences of my life. Uh, we ended up, I think, doing about six films together and um, right up to the last one in 2017 and he passed away in 2019 in Poland. And um, I was very intimidated around Richard for many reasons, but uh, because of his, his immense intelligence, his, his knowledge of so many things, uh, I considered him a musicologist so uh, as just a simple composer, as I would think I am, uh, having to constantly justify, uh, discuss, argue at times. We got into some heated arguments about a lot of things over the years, but uh, working with him was, uh, again, it was just an incredible experience for me. Um, and, um, Musically speaking, I'm not sure we can open up a few questions. I'll just give you a few backgrounds on actually the music itself. Um, I, a lot of the, I, I countered my, I would call it chamber orchestra music, which was predominantly the strings. And we used some flugel horns, which I play the trumpet, uh, French horns, things like that, to balance or to counter uh, the other side of the film, which was this, a guttural, native, melodic, oral history passed down traditional music that uh, the native, uh, I would call it the First Nations Aboriginal people at the time, brought to the film. So I tried as best as I could to keep the score sparse and small because we were competing against the outdoors so much. I felt the last thing that that we could wanted to have would be a very large Hollywood score to such an intimate film, uh, an intimate film where at times we were having uh, very hefty discussions with um, the sound editors because in in the uh, scene at the beginning when they're protesting you'll see flies going by this and they were putting in the fly sounds as the flies were going by and. They were trying to pull down my music, and I was trying to push my music up because I thought the music was more important than the flies going by. 
So it was quite an interesting experience. Um, in the end, it worked out really well, but the funny story I, I will tell is, uh, is the, the predominantly guttural chants, I would call it the, the screaming of, of, uh, and the drums, uh, was Jimmy, Dick, and the Eagleheart singers, uh, who I worked with back in Toronto in, uh, it was 1990 when we composed and created the score. And um, there was Wolf, Floyd Westerman, and it was a very funny story because I can't quite remember how it happened, but we heard a traditional version of which was what was predominantly used at various times throughout the film, whether it be through flute and um, or the vocals from Floyd, uh, Graham brought it uh, to the table at some point. And we did our research and we found out that this was actually a traditional native, uh, let's call it song, melody. And we went to Floyd and we said, this is clearly traditional. This is, this is really great. I mean, how do you know this? He said, oh, this is not traditional. This is, this is mine. I created this, and I was like, because he's a musician, a beautiful uh, musician in his own right, very talented man. So I said, okay, well, how does it work then? Because the, the traditional one goes, He says, no, that's not mine, mine's different. And I said, well, how's yours go? And he goes, So in the end, he, he won out, so uh, he gets credit for that. And then I decided that it was my job to support it with the other side. And you'll hear the white male vocal in there was from the late Michael Burgess. And back in the 90s, he was a very famous opera tenor, uh, theater stage. He was Jean Valjean in Les Miserables, along with many other great roles. He had a moment where he, uh, he was doing the national anthems in Toronto uh, for Hockey Night in Canada, and then they moved him around. So, uh, my idea was to create a counterbalance between those two, let's call them cultures. And um, I think we did a, a, a good job. And um, Shelley, do you have anything you want to add in terms of uh, anything? The amulet, maybe? Maybe you have more stories. I'll pass you over to Shelley because she was uh, worked closely with the writer at the time, Rob Forsythe. And there was actually a director on board before Richard came who left the project by the name of Don McBearden, and he left, and that's where uh, Richard came in. And then I'll turn it over to you, Shelley. Hi. Uh, actually, that was the first time I've seen the movie in 30 years. I'm going to say something, something like a trip down memory lane, but probably more like a trip down nightmare alley. <laughs> um, as Shane said, as I was working for the producer, I was a creative executive for the producer, Stephen Roth, who had optioned the book, A Dream Like Mine by M.T. Kelly, which had won the Governor General Award, um, I think the previous year. And I was newly on the job and Stephen handed me the book because I wanted to make a movie about this. <laughs> and um, that was my job to be the creative, to work and find the writer to do it. And uh, I chose Rob Forsythe, who was the, unfortunately who's passed about 15 years ago, but who's an incredible writer. And I didn't actually know him at the time, but I had read his writing. And we worked on the script for two years uh, to try and get it right, um, to try and keep the essence of the book and the heart of what MT was trying to say and what trying to do. And we did actually work with another director for about two years, and then he had to leave the project, which is when Richard came in. And I don't know if there's questions about the actual story. Um, it's, so the, it's an interesting thing. When the film came out, because of it examined when is talking not enough, when is violence to become contemplated, how much violence is too, too much, is it any too much, or is some okay, and how does it get out of control, all of those things we were, you know, spent a lot of time ruminating about during the time of the script. And as I think Bud Rick had said at some point in there, is um, 
you know, the, the legal system and the appeals, it's like justice seemed to be done as opposed to actually any real justice. And that's always a big theme that we spend a lot of time talking about. And a lot of people have wondered about the level of violence and was this a sort of the First Nations violence? I mean, our take on it always was that it is um, Peter Maguire's anger has come to life in the sweat and is manifested by Arthur. And that's why you probably noticed through the film at many, many times where Peter says, stop, Arthur does stop when he's taping up the um, reporter and the people in the first room and he brings the club up and he's going to hit him and he says, stop. So Peter does have the control. So it is his rage all the way through and he has to finally act and do something by the end of the film. But it doesn't really answer the question of is violence completely wrong? We didn't feel that this was an answer that we were prepared to give and, and we wanted to really be honest and show I think Bud Ricketts and um, Arthur's, they were very strong points of view and the sort of lip dick in the middle is Peter Maguire, who is sort of the liberal, I'm going back to, he's certainly not a white hero. He is literally in the middle, thinking he knows everything, feeling really strongly, but really not doing anything, not taking a stand. Bud Ricketts at least takes a stand. It, it may very well be the wrong stand, but at least he's very firm in what he thinks. Anyways, I'd like to open it up to any questions that people might have as opposed to blabbing away. But before we do, I have one more question. And then it's all you. Yeah, can I, I just I, say one more thing yeah. about that, yeah. just about the violence? It's just that, you know, people at TIFF in 1991, when it debuted at TIFF, people, like numerous people at the points of violence were running out of the theater yelling because they, they couldn't take the violence that was happening. And there's actually only three or four major scenes of violence. But it's real violence because real violence doesn't creep up around the corner with a large soundtrack telling you it's about to happen. Things are fine, and then the next thing, chaos is happening, and all hell breaks loose. That's real violence, and I think in terms of this film, uh, that's one of the things that's most remembered. It's talked about as being one of the most violent films people can remember. With nary three or four scenes of, of violence, but it was real, so uh, we all tried to try to support that as well. All right. Um, this question uh, I have to ask because it's raised um, on the other commentary track. Um, there's a White Earth and Anishinaabe film scholar named... Damn it, now it's gone. I ran out to ask him. Uh, Shawano Chad Oren. Yeah, Shawano Chad Oren. Sorry, sir, if I've got your name wrong. Um, he wants to know about the moose. And I <laughs> wondered how the moose was done. I did ask Richard, but I was wondering if you could give more insight into that. That is a, a real, uh, what I understand from Richard is that's a real dead moose that's being manipulated. Yes, it was, it was a real moose uh, that was roadkill, basically. It was roadkill, and then uh, it was preserved because they needed it for the scene, and they were off camera just blowing air. To make it look alive. They were blowing air through a tube to make it look like it was still alive and still breathing. But it was, in fact, a dead. I'm not sure about the snake, and I'm not sure about the, uh, the spider. The, the snake is fake, according to Richard. But, um, okay, but so you had people who were just... You put the call out, keep an eye out for a roadkill moose, or how? Yeah, I, I believe that's... Up in Northern Ontario, there's quite a lot of them. Yeah. yeah, it's not hard to find something like that up in Northern Ontario. <laughs> so they may have had it on ice for weeks, knowing that the film crew was coming to town to shoot this, but uh, again, all I, all I said when I, when I saw it was, I mean, you know, these are the things when you're part of the crew, which I came in after, but... I've been working in the film industry for many years and seen such things, and there were literally hoses running off screen under the grass, hidden, with the guys going <laughs> to make the moose still look like it was somewhat alive. I'm done. Anyone? Questions, please. Somebody must have a question. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> Way in the back. Hi. 
Uh, I hope you're okay with this. Sure. Uh, yeah, no problem. Uh, hello. So, um, the big question that I have when I heard that the director is uh, or was Polish, right? Um, do you think that that added like a different perspective because it's a very Canadian film? So, do you think there's like a new twist on that because of the director's origin? I admit my opinion and you have yours. I think that he had a great observation because not being Canadian, he could look at all sides of the issue dispassionately and with no, no side taken previously. And I think you see that in the film, that he is able to look at all the sides. And I think it was really a blessing to get Richard. Our original director was Canadian and um, sort of knew the whole world of that you know I, I think you mentioned it at the beginning that originally in the book it was about um the mineral uh sorry the mercury in the water and grassy narrows that's what the book was based on and when we changed it to clear cutting totally as you as you suspected for the visual reason because it was something that would actually be more visual but i think that it was all new to richard and he was fascinated by all sides of the argument because that's his background and he I think that added something to it for sure. Yeah, and I'd also just say that, you know, Richard uh, had an interesting style as a director. Like, um, there were times in, in the film, like, he, he would start a scene at the climax. He wouldn't work up to it. And that was confusing for certain actors, I remember, from this particular film. There was talk about, why, is he, why are we working like this? Because Richard's belief was that, you know, if we plod along towards the climax, in terms of the shooting and the scheduling and how it works. And by the time we get to the climax, we've been so accustomed and become so used to where we're going that when we get there, who knows? His, his, his opinion was always of, let's start at the crazy climax and then we'll work back from there. And that's one of the things as a Polish director, I know because uh, I've had a lot of experience working with Polish people in the film industry since working uh, back then and with Richard is that that was common. And the other common thing was is that rehearsal time was 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 what it was all about. He would re they would rehearse because of the lack of ability to be able to take shoot and do take after take after take simply from the financial perspective and the resources. Uh, they would rehearse like crazy and just do a couple takes and then they they move on. So these are the things that Richard plus he had a tremendous reputation from interrogation which is another film, the one that he smuggled out uh, of Poland, actually. That film is violent, torturous in, in another way, uh, but equally as as powerful. So I think that's one of the reasons that just, was, just, he attracted you, you, attra you were attracted yeah, to him? Just to clarify what you were saying there um, about the rehearsal, rehearsal, rehearsal. In Poland, rehearsal time is um, free and film is very, very expensive, not Canada but in Poland, so he was um, of the training to rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and then just shoot it and I've got it. Whereas in North American films, it's shoot tons and tons of film and then we can make any film we want in the editing room. And this was a very, very different thing for Richard. It was like a couple of shots, we've got it, let's move on, which actors weren't used to. Yeah, I will tell a funny story as well of Richard. Uh, at some point he was uh, traveling through the States and. Uh, Midwestern America, and he, he came across a reserve, and he went into the reserve, I think for gas or something like this, and when he went in, there was a, a rental a DVD or an eight, a VHS rental section on the reserve where you could rent movies, and Clear Cut was there, but of course it was out, and he, he told them that he was the director of this film, and it was instant fame. He became an instant celebrity, not that he needed the 15 minutes of fame, and they told him that that particular film was never available for rental because it was, it was always uh, in such high demand. So another little tidbit. Thanks so much. All right. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah, one coming here. I guess a, a bit of a question and then a, a comment generally on the film because I, you know, made me think a lot. Um, the process for the screenplay because it is a 
movie of uh, award-winning novel. Yes. Um, and so the process of the screenplay, was that sort of a collective effort or did somebody do the screenplay? Uh, Rob, Rob Forsythe, who was a screenwriter and um, had done quite a bit of work in Canada. Uh, he hails back to writing on Night Heat. He wrote the screenplay from the beginning. There were um, probably five, six drafts. We went over and over it because you're taking um, a book which is written to read and um, has interior monologue in it and you're trying to make it visual and you're trying to keep um, honest to the essence of MT's vision, which was quite you know, spectacular, but you also are, have a new medium and you're going to be telling it as a film. And we did something uh, which is not everybody does at the end of two years of developing it just prior to um, production, we actually sent it to MT to see what he thought of it. And a lot of filmmakers won't do that because authors often don't like their films because they've already envisioned it a particular way. MT was very, very gracious. He read it and he said, you've taken it, it's a film now, but with my blessing, you've captured the essence. And we felt that we'd done our job, even though we had changed a lot of things. Okay, and I, I just brought that up first because um, the book itself has is inspired and came from experiences or thoughts or processes of the author, right? Which gets us back to the characters, which gets us back to the the storyline even pre being written, and so in that process, I think one a, a mistake was made in moving to clear cuts from um, what it, the original intent was which was mercury and lead and all kinds of things in the water, which were deforming animals, deforming children, yeah. turning brains to mush, um, ruining um, reproduction, um, all these kinds of things that all feed, which would be hard to do visually, but is also the challenge that would feed into the mindset of our protagonists, antagonists in the film, um, leading to the point where we're were, were brought to the point of feeling an emotion in the violence that is defensible by the white man to fight back. We don't feel that we didn't feel that when they fought back. We fought it from the Indian when he was putting it and not, and not without that context that was stronger than the, than the clear cut could give us. Okay. Doesn't give us the feeling of what the Indian had in the first place to, to have such a strong reaction to make them feel what he felt. In, in I, I understand what you're saying. You're saying because of in the book, um, you had the deformed children and all the things that had happened in Grassy Narrows, you felt that you understood the, ang the anger more. It still happened in Grassy Narrows. Well, yes, exactly. It's still happening. Um, it was a creative decision that was made at the time, but I understand what you're saying. And there were also a lot of uh, 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 people were equating, you know, because Oka was happening back then, if you remember back in the late 80s, and I believe a lot of that started over land. Oka happened in land, before, yeah, before, golf before. Yeah, it was land, it was a golf course issue, so. Uh, there, I want, if, 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 go ahead. If I, could, I want to clarify what you're saying, because I, I, I'm not sure I followed it, but you're saying that, um, Arthur's motivation would have been stronger if he was fighting for humans and not trees. Um, in a simplified way, but sort of. Uh, I'm, I'm saying that the emotional impact would be more clearly understood mm -hmm. in terms of the impact of the violence right. if it was from what the intent of the violence was in the first place. Yes, there's an emotional reaction to clear cutting and the effects that it had, but it's not like holding your mentally anguished, um, deformed child in your hand and going hunting and finding all, you know, like his True. I think, I think yeah, what we felt was it sort of, I, I hear what you're saying. I think, you know, and it's a sort of, a, it's a creative difference. We felt that it was an environmental um, pain that uh, Arthur was representing, that the damage to their land and to the trees and the people was very emotional and was a very um, strong drive. 
but I hear that it didn't work as well for you. So <laughs> I, I, I want to ask a follow up question based on what you said. It's an interesting point. I, I hadn't thought of that. It's an interesting point, but I want to ask a follow up question. There is a film about mercury poisoning and its impact. Prophecy, the John Frankenheimer film. Was that at all part of the process of like changing it from mercury poisoning to clear cutting? You didn't want to have another mercury poisoning. No, it was clear cutting was um, in the news, and it was a big thing that was going on, and it was just destroying the forest. And there, you know, it was an awful lot going on, not so much in Ontario, but out but out here. Mm -hmm. And we were very very aware of it and thought it was a very relevant thing. It would be more visual, and it was extremely relevant to the destruction of the trees and, and going on to native property and land that we decided to go that way. Yeah, and they're much more sophisticated today. Clear cutting still exists in very strong levels. It's just done in ways to hide it, and it's done more selectively and things like that. So, you know, these are definite issues that are front and center. Um, what did I want to say? I just wanted to say, uh, as, a, as just a thought, uh, again, being involved in the project and being from Newfoundland, the family, English, Irish, um, you know, the, the white savior part comment that, that came up clearly, and I think Shelley said it very succinctly where, I mean, P Peter was not, a, he was not a hero. He was no Kevin Costner in Dance of the Wolf. He was a fumbling fool, right? A bumbling fool in many, many ways. And I just, I just now ask myself the question because it's more with the with uh, the, the the push and the and the justifiable um, world that we live in now, which would say, would clear cut have it been made today, even been possible to be made by uh, white people Christians? Mm -hmm. It's a big question. It's like the uh, Tom Hanks now looking back says he would never do Forrest Gump because he's not mentally challenged. He would never do Philadelphia because he's a heterosexual male. He, it's kind of, we live in an environment now where they would leave that up to uh, to more appropriate versions of, of such. And I just wonder if right now, looking back at Clerica, how, how, if it would have even, maybe this is a question for you, Shelley, I can ask you, would it be possible to make this film today in the I environment guess, that we live in? You know, I guess we have to step further back because the film is based on a book written by M.T., who is white, but he purposely wrote it uh, clearly that it was his own anger and his own rage at, at white liberal um, impotence. And that's the place he's coming from. He's not saying that he can speak for um, the First Nations, that he really doesn't know them, and he doesn't know that anger to, and that pain. And, and this story tries to show you how he gets as close as he can to feeling that pain. But it is basically the rage inside of, at uh, white liberal in, um, impotence. So yeah. I think that. You'd have to say, what should, would have MT been able to write the book today? I, I think he can, because I think he had a very honest way in. Yeah, and there's also, you know, when, when the police officers the, the, the shot, and then the, the second police officer's bludgeoned, that's when Wolf comes. You know, was Wolf real? Was Wolf a trickster too? Was he a spirit? He revives out of nowhere. He disappears, and all these things happen. But he looks at Peter, and he says, you drain anger, and your anger is real. And then he just disappeared. So it was like, in that sense, Peter McGuire was driving the narrative of anger and yeah, violence. I'm always surprised when anyone thinks that Arthur actually was real and was doing all of this and, you know, was a crazy psychopathic um, Indian. I'm always surprised when somebody walks away and actually thinks that that was the case. Yeah. And, and misses all all the sort of clues that are just sort of. Sometimes I wondered if we were too heavy-handed about it because the clues are just all the way through the film. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sure? yeah um, final question. Uh, maybe. <laughs> Hi, hello. I'm just curious how long the shoot was and also how arduous the location scouting was. Was it always going to be Ontario? 
Yes, we were, were it was a Toronto producer. So it was all the, the producer Stephen Roth was from Toronto, so it was always going to be in Ontario. And because MT had written about Grassy Narrows, which is in Ontario, everything came from Ontario. And um, it, this, I'm trying to remember how long the. I think it was like I, I really cannot remember. Do you remember how many it, days it, the shoot some, was? Something wants me to say in the twenties. Yeah, but I don't in remember. In the like twenty-three days, twenty-four days, it was you know short. Not compared to like a TV movie today, but no, I think it was like, like 23, 24. Yeah. It was up in Thunder Bay, which was up near Thunder Bay, which was absolutely beautiful, beautiful terrain. But there was one funny, not funny, but you know, the house filming goes, there was a situation when he drags him out to the edge of the cliff and he's going to let him hang there and, until he sees all the stuff that, it, that his machines have done. Um, they were very upset with that because apparently during the location scouting, they determined this was going to be the spot, and and you could see like t t 20 miles of beautiful f landscape, and then and then on the day they shot it, it was raining almost, so you couldn't see anything. So you know, you had to kind of ima imagine it. But I do remember Richard just thinking, "Dang, it bothers me that we couldn't have shot that when it was as I saw it when we decided to film there." Um, about that location, um, is the rock art real or is it something that was created? That was created. Anyone? All right. <laughs> it came up in when you were talking at the beginning about you had a friend who came and wondered why um, they did it. Graham. Graham and then Westerman too, to, to a certain extent, why they would do it. And, and for me, having been um, mostly in that milieu for most of my life, you've got Oka, you've got Gustafson Lake, you've got, like, especially at that time period, there was lots going on. Uh, the West Bank and, the, and, the, and everything that's going on in the Middle East right now, that was all going on back then too. So I felt very strongly from <laughs> The, their acting and their choice that they knew exactly what they were doing and that they did that they did their part in it um, for those who had ears to hear that's that's what I got from them. yeah I think Arthur's humor is all coming from there you know you think you know you think you know things you know I think that he's all that humor that he put in was yeah. really and again, yeah, and again it's subjective and you know who, who knows but that that this role is is pretty pretty well known as Graham Greene's finest performance in his career. If you look back at everything else he's done as a fabulous actor, a theater stage actor, just a monumental talent beyond belief. But uh, I believe this this is the role that he he's, he sunk his teeth into more than anything else. I believe he believes that too. I believe he makes it this his finest film. I, I think that's I bet or heard that somewhere. Okay. All right, everyone, thank you. I hope you enjoyed the film. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thank everyone yeah. wants to come see the pendant. It's right up here for a few minutes. Yeah. The Iron Bow Review. Gentlemen with the tooth. The Iron Bow Review. Hello? Amen.